So to answer all the comments, past, present, and maybe future about where I go for a few months, if I'm either burnt out, have things going on in my life, or just don't have pressing video ideas, then sometimes I will step back away from YouTube. Because this is not my job at all, this is my hobby. I make videos because I want to make them, and really have no incentives otherwise. So don't worry if you don't see me for a while, it's just because I'm chillin'. What are your opinions on a dex-based paladin? I really like this question because dex-based paladins aren't the most popular, and you could argue that they're not mechanically efficient, but really in 5th edition it's hard to make a character that completely doesn't work. So really my answer to this question if I'm asked, you know, what do you think of a dex-based paladin or a strength-based rogue, I'm just like, well, do you think it would be fun? Are you excited about playing this class in this new kind of unorthodox way? If that's the case, then yeah, play it. Because if you're a player that's really focused on min-maxing and mechanical perfection, you're probably not asking this question. You know, you're looking up guides online or on YouTube and finding the mechanically best build that's going to output the most damage or do the most healing. But really, I don't really care about that, and most players that I play with don't really as well. It's really what character are you going to have the most fun with. Because the thing that is going to be the most mechanically powerful isn't necessarily what you are going to enjoy playing the most. So, if you want to play a paladin that's jumping around everywhere, that's using a short bow and dual wielding short swords, then, you know, be my guest. If it fits your vision of the character, it's probably best. Does anybody know if the sequel to this vid ever came out? I've scoured all videos that have come out from then until now. What happened to the follow-up video? Where's the dragon video? Yeah, so this has been an albatross around my neck for a while, and uh, it's coming out tomorrow. It's finally done. Of course, the next question is probably, well, why did it take so long? And there are a few reasons. Mainly, Treasury of Dragons came out after I published that video, which completely reoriented how you can actually build and play a dragon in 5th edition. So it was a long and arduous process of trying to make a build and then test it, not just in one campaign, but over a few campaigns. And really seeing if it was fun to play, because I'm not going to recommend to you guys a build for a character that, heck, you might be playing for a year, two years, three years, and it to just be a dud. And at the core of it was really just trying to get the video right. At a certain point I just decided I wasn't going to rush the video, and it was going to come out when it was ready. So now it's finally ready, and it's coming out. And by the way, thank you all for your patience, I think it will be worth it. It's actually one of the videos that I am most proud of. And certainly the video that I have put the most time and energy into, literally hundreds of hours trying to get this thing right. Next question though, out of curiosity, how often do you level up your players, characters, in 1-20 to 20 campaign? I've toyed around with different time frames and haven't found one I'm satisfied with. So this is what you need to know about me and leveling in my campaigns. I don't like campaigns that go far beyond a year. Now that's with the caveat that these are very consistent weekly games. So a typical campaign for me might go anywhere between 12 to 15 months. And in that time, I'm doing anywhere between 40 and 60 sessions. Usually, I am leveling up the characters once every three to four sessions. And that will definitely accelerate towards the end of the campaign, where they might level up every one or two sessions in Tier 4 of play. Because past level 16, Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition becomes a completely different game. Now, for some groups, that would be rather fast, but most of my players have lots of other characters that they want to play, and they want to try out every single class. So it's with player buy-in and consent that after about a year, we're going to be done, they're going to reach 20th level, we're going to move on to new characters in a new campaign. So for your campaign, it's hard to say. I would honestly recommend getting to levels 4 or 5 as quickly as possible, leveling them up every two or three sessions, maybe even faster than that, depending on playtime. 
and how often you're running the game. Like if you're running a monthly campaign, probably a level up every session is fine. Because even with that leveling strategy, it's still going to be almost two years before you get to level 20. Now if the upper echelon of your campaign is level 10 or 11, then you should probably double that number. So if I would be leveling every three to four sessions, I would probably move that up to leveling every six to eight sessions. And the next question is probably the question that I have gotten asked most often on the channel, and it comes from my druid video. Druids aren't allowed metal armor though, because in that video I talk about how, you know, you should be able to get a breastplate for your druid or something like that. And people all freak out and they go, wait, breastplates are made of metal. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, in the proficiencies of the druid class it says druids will not wear armor or use shields made of metal. And if you want to go technically rules as written, there is a very simple way around this. You just get a breastplate not made of metal. So this is something that I try to impart to new D&D players often, which is D&D is a game built around imagination. It is a collective role-playing game. And in the midst of that collective role-playing game where you're using magic and you're fighting monsters like dragons, is it so insane to say, oh yes, I am going to be looking for a breastplate made of wood or the hide of a dragon instead and not made of metal. So that's one way to look at the quote-unquote problem. But then there is the second solution, which is the one that me and a lot of other great DMs follow, which is, yeah, we don't follow that. Like, honest to God, I just do not care. Because through every edition of Dungeons & Dragons, they have imposed mechanical limitations that try to steer roleplay. And I think the best example of this is, I forget which edition, it might have been 3rd edition, where paladins could only be lawful good or good characters. When I was a young kid, I asked kind of my dungeon master mentor about it because I wanted to play a paladin and he went, oh yeah, I do not care about that. Play a paladin with whichever alignment you want. And that's honestly how I look at druids, which is that if I have a player that wants to wear metal armor and they are a druid, it really doesn't affect the character at all. And maybe that's blasphemy, I don't know, but I've played and ran for so many druids, I'm like the druid guy on YouTube, and my games have not combusted into flames. Honestly, I think if you are a dungeon master or a game master for any system, and there's a rule that you see that you just don't understand or agree with, skip it, really. And this is advice from other game designers as well. One of my favorite games, Band of Blades, literally says this in the text of the book. You don't need to use all the rules or you can make adjustments here or there to fit your exact game. So if you care a lot about things like druids not being able to wear metal armor, then yeah, go along with that. If you really don't, it doesn't matter. Some more druid questions though, like one, what's the benefit of going full con for a moon druid, as you'll be using your wild shapes con value? Apologies if this seems like an obvious question, I'm extremely new to D&D. Alright, this comes from my moon druid video, and the reason why I advocate going full constitution for a moon druid is in case you get knocked out of your wild shape. You're going to still need enough constitution to survive the round and then get back into the wild shape. So with a higher constitution, you'll be able to do that. And you can do this for a combat wild shape moon druid because you're not relying on your spells to do damage or shut down enemies in combat. Plus, there are so many druid spells that don't actually require any attack rolls or saves that you can build around. So as long as you're not relying on your spells to fight, you can dump wisdom as a moon druid, go full constitution, dexterity, intelligence or charisma, and have a really well-rounded character. Let's see, another druid question. What are your thoughts on the new 1D&D &D UA druid and the moon druid? I think they've butchered it badly. Um... Yeah, so I haven't talked about 1D&D because this is playtest material, and they are just putting these ideas out there to the public right now. I think one thing though that the UA got right is having these designated stat blocks for the wild shapes. Or at least a bucket catch-all stat block in case you want to turn into an animal that Wizards of the Coast doesn't have a stat block for. Whatever you think of its implementation, I'm actually completely okay with that. And you know what? If a little ferret is doing as much damage as a black bear sometimes, whatever. We're playing a fantasy game and you can flavor things however you want. I'm not a stickler for those types of things. That being said, 
I think that they butchered the rest of the class. It stripped away so much of what I loved about the druid class. It stripped away things like medium armor. It strips away the temporary hit points that you gain in a wild shape. And it further just locks the progression of wild shape in general. I don't know why they felt such a need to take away druid's most defining class feature. Do I like some of the other additions like Healing Blossoms and Wild Companion? Yeah, they're nice, but the rest of the class is just so alien to what I loved in 5th edition's Druid. And I really don't even want to get into Moon Druid and how they've completely altered that subclass. It just feels so off, and I probably won't be switching over to 1 D&D or D&D 5.5 or whatever they're calling it now. I mean, moral concerns with Wizards of the Coast aside, I think it's just a worse game if this is the playtest material that comes through. But we'll see in time. I know a majority of people will probably switch over to 5.5, and I hope that it is still a fun and engaging game. Because when Dungeons & Dragons prospers, the entire hobby as a whole prospers. But I would be lying if I wasn't really rooting for other game systems to rise and kind of have this more competitive market share. Let's see, next question. Can you link your Vanquisher subclass? So this comment was left under my Fighter Guide video where I momentarily mentioned my Vanquisher subclass for the Fighter, which is a Fighter subclass based around critical hits. And I think the short answer is yes, I definitely want to be releasing my Vanquisher subclass. But more than that, I have so many homebrew classes, subclasses, spells, and items that I want to share with all of you. Because at this point, I've literally had hundreds of players use some of my homebrew, and some pieces of homebrew have become staples in my campaign world. And I really think you guys would enjoy this stuff. Like, one of the staples in my campaigns is a spell called Oblivion Chain. This is what the spell does. And I think its main draw is twofold. One, just thematically throwing these black chains of energy around an enemy just sounds cool. And the second is mechanical because every black chain that hits will continuously do damage over time until a creature spends an action or a bonus action to remove one chain. So if you're a class like, I don't know, Sorcerer or Warlock that doesn't learn all of these different spells, Oblivion Chain scales really well, and it has some fun interactions with the Sorcerer class and the Wizard class as well. Eventually, I really want to show off a homebrew class of mine known as the Bounty Hunter. <laughs> well, not necessarily me, but my players have really been trying to convince me to do so, because for so many of them that have played the Bounty Hunter, they say that it's their favorite class. Now, of course, take that with a huge grain of salt. But the feedback for some pieces of homebrew have been so overwhelmingly positive that I do want to share it with you guys eventually. I'm looking into maybe setting up a website or a Patreon just so that you guys can get this stuff. And after that, I need to set up everything on the business end and make everything look nice. But don't worry, it's definitely something that I want to do. Why do you have the same voice as Max Durat? Who the hell is that? If I have the same voice, then yeah, that's cool. I think I don't know who they are. If they're a bad person, then no. Bad. Boo. If they're a good person, then yeah, I'm like them. Tell me in the comments who the fuck Max Durat is. Let's see. Do you plan on uploading a Vox Machina Season 2 review? I was considering it, but the video just kind of boiled down to, man, this is really good. Better than Season 1. I'm very much excited to continue watching the show going forward. I think Season 2 was a dramatic improvement on Season 1, mainly because it didn't feel like the Percy show all the time, and a lot of the other characters really got a chance to shine, particularly two of my favorites in the campaign, Keyleth and Grog. So I guess this is my review. It's really good. Ooh, and this is kind of a bigger one. Uh, many comments asking if I will return to covering Critical Role Campaign 3. And the short answer to this is no. The long answer is that I've really fallen off Campaign 3. Now I've caught up a few times, and so far I most recently caught up to episode 52, but I'm just not enjoying the campaign for a number of reasons. But those reasons aside, I don't think it's worth anybody's time for me to sit down and go, yeah, I didn't like the episodes again. Maybe next week it'll be better. Plus, in some of the final episodes where I was doing my first impressions of Critical Role Campaign 3's new episodes, 
there was just some weeks where there was nothing to talk about. I don't want to get too far into it, but Campaign 3 moves at a snail's pace, with many plot lines just not moving or just getting dropped altogether. There's a lot of repeating of past conversations, and the characters don't have some of the emotional depth that Campaign 2 and Campaign 1 had, so there's just not a lot to discuss. If there was, then it would have been a lot easier to make those videos. But at the current moment, it's just really hard to cover. And if I'm not particularly enjoying the content, at least not enough to give my full attention to the video for four hours straight, without, I don't know, glancing at my phone or scrolling through Reddit when things get slow, then it's just not worth anybody's time, you know? Alright, this video is getting a little long, so final question. Will it be correct to say that during the campaign, the players will concentrate on campaign arcs more and more than on other arcs? So this comment was left under my video about how to plot a D&D campaign, or really how to create one. As you can't really plot a D&D campaign, you can try to structure arcs in a campaign, but that will depend on the campaign. So let's take a campaign like Curse of Strahd. Many people in the comments of that video have said, well, you can't plot a D&D campaign. You don't know where it's going to go. Kind of, but there are pre-written adventures, and we kind of know how those are going to end. When we talk about these big campaign arcs, we mean, things like, oh, the players in the end are going to have to deal with Strahd, or in Tomb of Annihilation, the players are going to get to the Tomb of Annihilation. It is that big central question that is at the heart of a campaign. And ideally, if you're structuring a campaign right, all of those different plot threads are meeting at this one final point. That's how we have BBEGs and campaign finale villains. They're finale villains because they're tying up all the loose narrative plot threads in the campaign, at least most of them, else they're just kind of another villain of the week. But in some campaigns, the players are going to be more engaged with their characters' backstories, or an arc relating to a certain NPC or an organization. But I do tend to think that in general, and this is a generality, throughout campaigns, you are going to be engaging with the overall arcing campaign arc more and more. Because if you don't, then you can have this sagging middle of the campaign, where the party doesn't feel like they're making progress and they're just kind of spinning their wheels. So if that central engagement to the campaign arc continues more over time, you can help alleviate that problem. That's not saying that this is the only way to do something, nor is it saying that you should absolutely stick to this one path that you foresaw at the beginning of the campaign. That overarching campaign arc is subject to a lot of change, which is why we need to keep it vague, like I say in the video. So to wrap around and answer your question, would it be correct? I don't know, probably. Like a lot of answers in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, it kind of depends on your campaign. I try to give more solid tips that have worked for me, because sometimes new DMs don't want, it depends on your campaign. They want an answer that they can begin to work off of, and if it doesn't work, then they can find a new answer. That's kind of a guiding philosophy with this channel, because there's always an exception. But if I can give you an answer that's worked for me that you can begin to work off of that might work for you, sometimes that's all a new DM needs. Because it's hard to DM in 5th editions, there is so much placed on the DM and the players actually have to do very little. So if you're looking to become a great DM and level up your DMing skills, if you haven't yet, watch this video right here. This is one of my personal favorite videos that I've ever made, and thank you for entering the dungeon.